Kia ora, uh, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, kia ora everyone, uh, ko Megan Takawingwa. Uh, I hope that you are very much enjoying uh, the conference so far. And I love the conference theme, Igniting Possibilities. Uh, and so my, the purpose of my uh, chat today is to think about how to ignite possibilities in the context of creating a sustainable funding plan. A uh, quick introduction first up. So my name is Megan Thorne, as I think I've said three times now, so I just wanted to, to, to be sure you uh, caught that. Uh, and I'm from an organisation called Exult. So we are passionate about working towards all community and not-for-profit organisations working at their full potential. And the way that we do that is through providing training and support for community and not-for-profit organisations working uh, at, at focusing on the business end of your organisation. So uh, all sorts of uh, different uh, workshops and resources are focused around really awesome and important things for your organisation like raising funds, uh, raising funds through different income streams, uh, raising your profile in the community, so shouting from the rooftops the difference you make uh, in your community. Uh, around things like strategic planning, governance, a whole raft of, uh, uh, of uh, workshops and resources focused on uh, running your organisation. And we do it in lots of different ways. So sometimes I have uh, the uh, fantastic opportunity to be part of conferences like this morning. So thanks very much to Arts Access Aotearoa for that opportunity. Uh, we run public workshops, uh, we do uh, in-house uh, workshops, and we create uh, resources. So Tonic Magazine is, is uh, an example of a resource that we create where we look for things that you would find helpful or we feel you would find helpful, uh, and we create resources uh, that you would find helpful uh, in the context of running your organisation. Uh, so a little bit about me. I've been a workshop facilitator and trainer for around about 20 years. Uh, every time I do that little tally up, I take a little uh, a little moment. Uh, and I'm really passionate about uh, community and community organisations and not-for-profit organisations. Uh, and I'm also really passionate about uh, ideas and creativity. And I think it fits really nicely in terms of igniting possibilities and in terms of creating a sustainable funding plan because sometimes we have to think about uh, what we do uh, in the context of raising funds differently so that uh, you can connect uh, with those who you're trying to connect to in terms of support. So I'm really fascinated by not so much the, the, the how you have ideas as in they happen in your head or the neuroscience behind it, but more about how we have ideas and how we share them with those that we work with. So uh, if we do share, what are the things that contribute to uh, making us feel safe enough to do that? If we don't, what are the things that get in the way? Uh, and some really helpful processes to get through from idea to action. Uh, and I'll be sharing some ideas with you as we go through the session this morning uh, to help you think about uh, raising funds for your organisation through different income streams in different ways. So acknowledging that uh, we'll have uh, people who are part of the session who are from very large organisations and those from smaller organisations. Some of you are based in uh, large cities, some of you are based in smaller communities, some of you are based in tiny communities. Uh, and what I'd love you to take out of this session is if you have activity in an income stream already, what are some ways uh, that you can possibly leverage that a bit more? And if you're not earning income through uh, a specific income stream that we talked through today, then where are some opportunities for you to do that within your community? Okay, so where I would love to start, actually, and let me uh, remind you to, uh, please add your questions to uh, uh, the chat as we go through the session. Uh, and as Jane mentioned, James mentioned, if you see someone who pops a question uh, into the chat uh, that you uh, would like to also hear the answer to, uh, please uh, do what you need to do so it pops it up the, uh, up the list uh, in the question Q&A tab. Uh, we won't have the opportunity to answer all of your questions in the session today, but what I did want to do is uh, create a bit of a document, a Q&A document. So if we don't get to your question during the session, uh, after the session, uh, we'll uh, share with you a Q&A document where we can touch on some of the topics that we haven't been able to cover of in the session. Uh, and also I wanted to let you know as well, uh, we'll share with you some resources. So handouts that cover uh, the things that I talk about in the session. 
Uh, I would love you to finish this session with a sore hand from taking lots and lots and lots of notes uh, because that's actually one of the ways that you remember things too is the making connections and then writing down what those what ideas for your own organisation. So please do, uh, I welcome you to finish this session with a sore hand from writing. Uh, and also uh, be safe in the knowledge that uh, resources will come your way after the session as well. So I've charged into the session and I've missed a very important piece, which is to uh, describe myself. So uh, for those of you uh, describing myself, so I am today wearing, I was thinking about this as James uh, introduced himself too. So today I am wearing uh, one of my favourite uh, tops. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a dark blue colour with some lovely lighter blue and different shades of blue flowers and uh, beige coloured flowers. So it's one of my favourite tops because it reminds me of a beautiful piece of art that my sister-in-law has on her wall. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a top that makes me feel really good. Uh, I have very uh, quite short uh, dark brown hair or light brown hair, maybe mousy brown hair. Uh, and uh, I have two holes in my cheeks, uh, which uh, some people call dimples, but I call lazy cheek muscles. So that's a little bit of a description of me. Okay, so where I'd love to start with our session, creating a sustainable funding plan working towards a stable table is with a definition of sustainable funding. I would love you to write this definition down and even if you uh, Google sustainable funding, you get thousands and thousands of different definitions. I'd love you to write this definition down and it'll come to you uh, in the handouts that we share as well. So the definition of sustainable funding is to have enough funds for a specific purpose on an ongoing basis. So there's three parts to that definition. To have enough funds for a specific purpose on an ongoing basis. And I'm gonna to talk to each of the three. Uh, so the first part of the definition is to have enough funds. It's impossible to create a sustainable funding plan for your organization if you're not very, very clear around how much you need, how much money you need. And that's in two, uh, in two uh, streams in terms of, of, of how much money you need. So one is how much money do you need to operate as an organization of a year? And how much money do you also need to raise? How much funds do you need to raise to enable you to grow, to enable you to achieve uh, the elements of your long-term plan or your strategic plan, or even grow uh, the, uh, uh, the services and activities and programs that you offer uh, in your community? So the first step is around having enough funds and be very being really clear around how much do you need. Uh, the second part of that definition uh, is for a specific purpose. So to have enough funds for a specific purpose. Uh, so I, I usually ask this question uh, and get a bit of feedback from everyone, but I'm going to imagine that you're putting up your hands uh, 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 where you're sitting. So I'd love to ask the question, how many of you have a budget? And I'm going to imagine that a smattering of you are putting up your hands. Uh, and I must admit that I, I am sometimes a little bit surprised when I ans ask this question uh, by uh, the number of people who, who maybe don't put their hand up so much. So the first step to knowing how much you need is to have a budget. Uh, so for those of you who do have a budget, I am wondering how many of you have a line in your budget specifically for administration costs? Uh, and then within your administration costs, I'm wondering how much of you, how many of you have a line uh, underneath administration costs, which is related to uh, how much funds you need to cover your uh, office expenses for the year. And then underneath office expenses, I'm wondering how many of you have a specific line for stationery? How much funds do you need to raise to cover the stationery that you use in the context of, of running your organisation? Uh, and then underneath that, I wonder how many of you uh, have a line specifically for ballpoint pens? Uh, so usually at this point, uh, when I ask this question, there's far less hands going up. I always live in hope that someone will go, yes, I have a line in my budget for ballpoint pens. And it sounds uh, like a very detailed budget, but here's the thinking behind it. And it's related to having enough funds for a specific purpose. Uh, so the more specific you can be in terms of how you uh, use your money or how you spend your money, the more that opens up opportunities to cover those funds or raise those funds uh, in different ways. So let me give you a couple of very quick examples. So 
Uh, Exalt, we run workshops uh, all over the country, uh, much less, I must say, uh, in the last year or so, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting back into uh, travelling all over the country and meeting lots of people doing awesome things. At every single one of those workshops, we provide a ballpoint pen. And when we were doing uh, exercise around our budget, walking through our budget line by line by line, uh, we realised that there was quite a bit of money that we were spending on providing those ballpoint pens. Uh, and so what we did was, because we knew how much, we then started to think about how could we cover those funds in different ways. And we have lots of organisations approaching us, and those organisations are often looking for the opportunity to connect with community and not-for-profit organisations. Uh, and we went to a few of them, and you, we said, you know, we've got this opportunity for you to uh, connect with community and not-for-profit organisations. Do you have branded pens? Uh, to which uh, quite a few of those organisations responded, yes, they did. And now we can provide a branded pen for people who uh, take part in our in-person workshops. So uh, branded pens from all sorts of different organisations. So Infoodle is one example. So Infoodle is an organisation that provides uh, customer relationship management software and a, a, a event organising platform for community organisations. Uh, and now most of the time people walk away from an exalt workshop, uh, in-person workshop with a, an Infoodle pen. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small example, but it's an example where we were then able to take that line out of our budget completely. So the more specific you can be in terms of how you spend your funds, the more that offers opportunities to raise those funds in a different way. And I'll actually share a couple of examples, uh, other examples of that as we go through uh, the session. So then the last piece of that definition uh, on an ongoing basis. So often when I ask the question, what does sustainable funding mean to you? The thing that comes back is uh, the ability or the opportunity or the ability to uh, raise funds in an ongoing nature from an income stream rather than one off, one off, one off. And that is absolutely a very important part of sustainable funding. So as we touch on some different income streams, I'll talk about what are some ways that you can move from one-offs in an income stream to ongoing, to raising funds in an ongoing basis. So I'm just going to repeat that definition one more time. So sustainable funding, when I talk about it, I'm talking about to have enough funds for a specific purpose on an ongoing basis. So one thing that I wanted to touch on too in the context of, of raising funds, and I'm going to just touch on it very, very briefly, is around how you as an organisation think about uh, funds. Because sometimes uh, the mindset that we have towards money can impact uh, our ability to ask for money. And also it can impact our confidence when we are going out into the community to connect uh, in terms of different income streams. So I would love you to really think about uh, how you uh, approach money. Uh, and I would love you to take up the challenge of, from this point on, uh, confidently going out into your community because you know that you provide uh, fantastic activities and services and programs for the people that you support in your community. So I want you to feel confident about going out to your community to look for the funds to help you do that because you are making a difference. Um, and that simple switch in terms of, of mindset. Um, you do awesome things. You deserve to have the funds that you need to do those awesome things. Uh, and also, there's a bit of work involved in raising the funds to do those awesome things. So I just wanted to ask a question. So thinking about uh, having enough funds and being specific in terms of how you spend your money, uh, we're going to do a bit of whizzy bang technology right now where we're going to create a word cloud based on how you spend your money, how you use your funds right now. So in front of you, uh, the question will pop up uh, in the tab. Uh, and the question is, what do you spend your money on? What are your costs? And I want you to type as many as you can think of into, uh, into uh, the chat. So uh, things like, I imagine, you might be uh, spending your funds on uh, wages, potentially, or rent, or uh, potentially uh, other utility bills. What do you spend your funds on? I'd love you to type them in right now. And I can see with the Swiss Baggy technology that two of you are typing right now. So I'd love for more of you to share. So what do you spend your funds on? What are your costs? Lovely. So we've got arts materials and programming, 
What else? Oh, look at this word cloud developing. So we've got staff costs, you've got materials, lovely. What else do you spend your funds on? Travel, lovely, travel, yeah, staff costs, lots of arts materials, awesome. What else? Equipment, lovely. Artist fees, awesome. I'm waiting for someone to write ballpoint pens. What else? What else do you spend your funds on? Awesome. Awesome. So travel is coming up quite, quite, uh, in quite a large kind of fashion. So, uh, in creating these word clouds, I don't know if you've used them before, but uh, the more that something is typed in, a word is typed in, uh, the more prominent that becomes within the cloud. So uh, you can see as the word cloud develops that we've got quite a bit of fun spent on travel. Equipment is definitely up there. We've got wages. We've got venue. Kai, awesome. Artist fees, supervision, contractors, lovely. What do you spend your funds on? Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so we could spend the whole of the session uh, asking that question, what do you spend your funds on? Uh, and indeed, I would love you to have that question top of mind uh, as you go back uh, after, after conference to think about uh, what you get out of the session. Uh, so I'm going to leave you putting uh, and typing in you what you spend your funds on. And I'm going to get you to just focus on my uh, flip chart here for just one second. So I wanted to do this uh, in a bit more of a visual way. Uh, and you'll need to use your powers of imagination a little bit uh, as I uh, put my visual or my uh, illustration skills into practice. Uh, so old school like, uh, I'd love you to uh, focus on the flip chart, which I'm pretty sure that you can see, uh, thank you very much, uh, on the screen. So I want you to uh, imagine that you've got the word cloud of all your costs up here. So there was equipment, and there was rent, uh, and there was travel. There are a number of different things that you spend your funds on. So I want you to use your powers of imagination and imagine the world cloud is sitting at the top of my flip chart. So now this line here across the uh, middle of my flip chart is a tabletop. So again, you're using your powers of imagination to imagine that this is a tabletop. So metaphorically, using the metaphor of a table, uh, all of your costs are sitting on top of the table, as it were. So now I want you to think about uh, income streams as table legs. So if you think about where does your income come from, which is something that we're going to think about in just a second. Uh, and sometimes when I ask this question, where does your income come from? I get uh, uh, grants is one of the prominent income streams I get and contracts is another. Uh, and I know for some of you too that you will be thinking about uh, some funding that you've just uh, you've received recently. Uh, what potentially are you going to do to create a sustainable funding plan once uh, that contract income uh, stops coming in? So I want you to think about table tabletop. All of your costs are, are, are balanced on top. If all of those costs are balanced on just one or two table legs. Uh, and for example, you don't get a grant that you've received uh, year after year after year, suddenly something happens uh, and that uh, funder is no longer to, able to provide you with that grant. Or you, you have a contract and you've had that contract in place uh, and suddenly uh, things change and you don't have that contract in place. Then all of those costs balance on the top of that table, your table suddenly becomes unstable. And you've seen that, you know, one leg tables, two leg tables, uh, they're definitely not the most stable of tables. So the way I want you to think about uh, sustainable funding and creating a sustainable funding plan is to, 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 to think about the fact that there's seven different income streams uh, that community and not-for-profit organisations uh, can tap into to raise the funds that you need to operate. So I'm gonna draw these up very quickly. Uh, and I need to say as I draw, because the faster I draw, uh, the less uniform the uh, table legs become. And I want to use the disclaimer first up that there is no correlation between uh, width of table leg and uh, importance of table leg. Uh, and there's no 
uh, correlation in terms of, of uh, importance in terms of order that we talk about them from. So the other different, other five income streams that sit with grants and contracts as an opportunity to raise funds for your organisation are membership, uh, donations, sponsorship, fundraising activities, which I'm going to write in shorthand. Uh, and uh, social enterprise or earned income. Okay, so now you've got a tabletop, which has all of your costs sitting on top, which can be supported potentially by up to seven income streams. And I'm going to give you a definition of each of the income streams in just a second. Uh, but I want to do a, a quick poll first. So second opportunity to use the awesome Wizbang uh, technology. I would love you to, uh, so first poll, I want you to think about, actually for, the, for all of these next questions, I would love you to think about income for your organisation. And I would love you to think about out of those seven income streams, where does your income come from? I'm going to ask the, uh, the question of each of the different income streams. What percentage of income, of your income, comes from each income stream? So as you go, we're going to do this as a poll. Uh, and so we'll get a clear picture across everyone who's part of the session. You've started already, that's awesome. But I also want you to make a note for yourself. So it's really important to think about where your income comes from. So what percentage of your income comes from contracts? And don't be worried about uh, dollars and cents. I'd just love you to think about percentage of income that comes from contracts. So for some of you, uh, 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 one to 10% of your income comes from contracts. Uh, for some of you, oh, right, okay, I'm just going to let the poll play out so that I can uh, uh, read the results. Uh, and as that happens, I'm just going to give you a definition of contracts. So contract, a third party, usually a government department, contracts your organisation to provide a specific service or programme and pays you for doing so. So I've talked through that quickly. The definitions of each of the income streams will come to you after the session. So I'd love you to think about that definition. A third party, usually a government department, contracts your organisation to provide a specific service or program and pays you for doing so. So, okay, so having a look at uh, how this plays out across uh, the uh, uh, across uh, people who are part of the session. So actually, uh, most of you, for most of you, you are not receiving income from contracts. So 1 to 10% of your income for 56% of you comes from contracts. So not, not a huge number. Uh, but for some of you, uh, uh, 80 to 90% uh, of your income comes from uh, contract income. So potentially, that's a very prominent leg on your table. All right, so now I want you to think about uh, the next income stream. I want you to think about grants. Uh, the, so the question's going to pop up in just a second. Right, what percentage of your income comes from grants? So grants are the definition. Uh, your organisation applies to funding bodies to fund specific projects or costs. So uh, they're not government departments usually, although there's a little bit of a crossover here and that DIA uh, also provides grants. Uh, so your organisation applies to funding bodies to, to uh, sorry, to funding bodies to fund specific projects or, con, uh, or costs. And your organisation is accountable for how uh, you spend the money. You need to show the funder that you've spent it in the way that you said you would. Okay, so um, so this is uh, quite interesting from a poll perspective. Uh, so uh, for uh, a, a larger number of you, so oh, it's going up and down and up and down and up and down. So if I add those all up very briefly, because maths is not my strong point, 2040, about 60 nearly 60 to 70 percent of you are raising uh, a, a large amount of funds from grants for your organization um, which congratulations uh, that is indeed the case for a, a large number of community organizations uh, so uh, we're not going to talk to grants today uh, but you'll know that the granting landscape has changed massively so it is very rare these days to receive the full amount of the grant that you're uh, looking uh, to uh, to raise. 
Uh, most often funders these days will want you to show that you are also working to raise some of the funds yourself. Um, and in some instances, uh, you know, funders have changed your criteria. So you may find that a grant that you were receiving, uh, you, you're not receiving anymore. Uh, you know, and at a, at a broad level too, uh, the pool for grants is, is sometimes getting smaller and the number of organisations looking for grants is sometimes uh, increasing. So if a large amount of your income uh, for your that's cut the, in terms of your table leg is coming from grants uh, then sometimes you might need to think of some other ways to bring income in so that if you lose that grant or you only get a portion of what you're looking for you've got other income streams to cover that funding so we're not going to cover off grants and contracts uh, in the session today but what I did want to do is I wanted you to to point you towards Match to Puna Tauri Te. So you may have heard of Match uh, already. Website is match.org.nz. Uh, it's a totally new initiative created by Philanthropy New Zealand, which can connect uh, organisations looking for funds with organisations who are providing funds. Uh, so you can sign up. If you're a Tier 4 organisation, you can sign up for three or your income's under a certain level. You can sign up for free. Uh, you can put information about your organization and then funders have the opportunity as they sign up to the platform to find you uh, because you fit within the criteria uh, within the organizations they're looking to fund. So that's as much as I wanted to say about grants, but go and check out match.org.nz. Okay, so next question in terms of uh, table legs. So I'd love to focus on membership uh, as uh, an income stream. So for, for how many of you or what percentage of your income comes from membership? Uh, and membership is where people pay a membership or subscription fee to belong and in return they receive specific services, benefits or privileges. Telling telling the answers to that specific poll. So uh, as part of uh, the session right now, none of you are earning income from, from membership. Awesome. So we're about to, to touch, ah, hang on a second. Uh, some, so one of you uh, is, uh, uh, is earning a small amount uh, from membership. Awesome. Okay, let's focus on the next table leg. So uh, donations, income stream. I'd love to hear from you. How many of you are raising funds for your organisation to support those costs uh, through uh, membership? Uh, right, actually, so uh, my apologies, everyone. I've just got a bit of a, a message to say that there's a little bit of a delay in terms of me asking the question and giving you the opportunity to respond. Uh, so hopefully you've had the opportunity to respond to membership now. Lovely. Uh, and I'd love to focus on donations as an income stream. So what percentage of your income comes from donations? Where people donate time, money and other resources expecting nothing in return. So donations can be both small or large. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm going to give you a, give you a second to respond. So what percentage of your income do you estimate comes from donations? Lovely. Okay, so for some of you, uh, there's a small percentage coming uh, from donations. So 1 to 10% of your income, 11 to 20%-ish of your income. Uh, so uh, lovely. Very good. Very good. It's really interesting. So we're going to talk about donations in just a second as well. Uh, and now I'd like to focus on sponsorship. So uh, what percentage of your income comes from sponsorship? Awesome. Okay, and here's a quick definition of sponsorship and we're going to talk about this in just a second. So uh, sponsorship, businesses contribute time, money or other resources and there's an expectation to receive something in return. So for some of you, around, you're sitting at around about, uh, again, so 1 to 10% or 20 to 30% uh, of your income is coming from, or that 1 to 30% is, is coming from sponsorship. Awesome. Okay, two more questions. You'll notice a pattern. Uh, right, I'd love to focus on fundraising activities. So what percentage of your income currently comes from fundraising activities? Awesome, thank you. Uh, definition of fundraising activities. Uh, so I really think there's an opportunity with fundraising activities. We're going to talk about this in, in just a second. But they're activities that are organised for the sole purpose of raising extra funds. So they rely usually on member or client involvement to help make them happen. Uh, and they do not in any way, shape or form have to relate to the services that you offer. So that's where I think the opportunity is. 
in that you can do anything as a fundraising activity. It doesn't have to uh, relate to uh, your organisation and the services and activities you provide. Lovely. So once again, Ooh, oh, interesting. So some of you who are part of the workshop, a large proportion of your uh, income is coming from fundraising activities. Awesome. Uh, and for others of you, you're at the other end of the scale. So uh, 1 to 20% is coming from fundraising activities. And last income stream, social enterprise. I'd love you to let me know. So what percentage of your income comes from social enterprise? So social enterprise or entrepreneurial activities or earned income is where your organisation trades uh, using a traditional business model, so trades products or services. Uh, and activities are not necessarily the core of what you do, but they definitely add value to your existing uh, to your existing why. Okay, so some of you, it's interesting too. So at different ends of the spectrum. So for a portion of you, a third of you, in fact, uh, no, changing that just because I said. Uh, so for some of you, uh, you're generating a huge percentage of your income from earned activities. Uh, and for some of you, it's the lesser end of the scale. And for some of you, you're in the mid. So that's, uh, that's really interesting. We'll talk about social enterprise and that opportunity to, to earn income from that income stream. So thank you for, uh, for answering the questions and for, uh, for sharing that via the poll. And now I hope you also, as you uh, were taking notes, uh, in front of you, and in fact I'll share a template as part of uh, the notes we share to follow up the session, you'll, ha you'll have a clearer idea of where your money is coming from at the moment. Uh, and ideally, in terms of creating a sustainable funding plan, you're looking to uh, generate a good level of income across three or four or five different income streams. So not all seven, uh, because you would probably fall over uh, from uh, trying to do too much. But the idea is if you've got a good level of income, so we're talking, you know, around about, depending on how many income streams you're operating in, uh, uh, a good level of income from three, four, five different income streams, then if you, uh, you, you know, you don't get the grant that you're looking for or something massive changes with your contract or uh, earned income, so one of your earned income streams uh, goes away for whatever reason, you've got income coming from the other income streams that you've got a good level of income coming in from, which keeps your, sta your table stable while you look for another income stream so that your organisation can keep operating while you're looking uh, for another income stream. So you're working towards a stable table in terms of those income streams that you're tapping into. So the first part of the session, I really wanted to, to step back for a moment and rather than diving directly into income streams, wanted to uh, have the opportunity to, to sort of think about the back end uh, of, of raising funds for your organisation. Uh, and there's a, a couple of top tips to take out. So one is to know how much money you need. How much money do you need to operate on a yearly basis and how much money do you need to grow to, to grow your programs to achieve what you want to achieve that you've set out in your long term or your strategic plan. Uh, so that's the first step. And the second step is to have a budget. So have a really detailed budget so that you know and you're really clear about what you need to raise over the course of the year and how that money is going to be spent over the course of the year. And then track that budget. So at the end of each month, you're looking at how are things looking. So in terms of for the, how I thought things would be going out and how we hope things would be coming in, what does the picture look like? So that you can adjust as you go. So uh, in months where you've brought in more income than you, uh, than you anticipated, you might be able to change your plan in terms of, of down the track and what you'd like to raise uh, from a different income stream. Uh, and so in terms of that budget too and your sustainable funding plan, uh, how much you need to operate plus how much you need to achieve your, uh, your, your to grow your organisation, to grow your programmes and activities or achieve your uh, long-term or uh, strategic plan sits at the top of your sustainable funding plan. That's the, the goal that you're looking to raise. Uh, and then underneath that, I always think it's a great idea to start your sustainable funding plan to think about how you're going to earn that income across a number of different income streams. So how are you going to achieve that total amount across earning income from memberships, donations, sponsorship, etc., or the combination of three, four or five different income streams? And I often think setting the intention or setting the goal for an income stream is where you start because once you set the intention, then often your focus and activity works towards achieving that goal. 
uh, but also setting the goal will give you a real good indication of what level of activity you'll need to have under each income stream in order to help you to get to that total amount. For example, if you're looking to raise, let's say you're looking to raise uh, $50,000 across a year uh, via donations, I've just plucked that number out of the air, then, uh, you know, and at the moment you're you're raising around about a thousand, then you know that you're going to have to do some focused activity around donations and building up your donations income stream in order to help you to get to that goal. So uh, total amount, uh, 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 contribution from each income stream, and then what initiatives are you running under each income streams to work towards raising that competition is a very broad overview of your sustainable funding plan. Okay. So what I'd love to do for the rest of the session is delve into uh, each of the income streams. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're not going to have the opportunity to delve into grants and contracts in the session right now. And actually, uh, you know, I usually run this workshop as a one day workshop. And I stand at the, uh, the, the, the start of the session and say, you know, each of these income streams can be a, a one day workshop in themselves. And so sometimes it can feel a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, uh, uh, sharing all of the ideas and thoughts uh, for each uh, income stream. And we won't have the opportunity to share as much today, but my goal for delving into each income stream, as I mentioned it already, is if you don't have activity in one of those income streams at the moment, then you're looking for opportunities. I'd love to ignite possibilities in terms of uh, starting to earn income from that income stream. So I uh, will share a couple of ideas to help you to do that, but also sometimes we have quite fixed ideas about what uh, each income stream is and how it works. We might even have fixed ideas about whether it's an opportunity for us as an organisation and I'd love you to park those ideas for now and I'd love you to approach each income stream with an open mind. So what if we could earn income from this income stream? What might it look like? Uh, and some of the ideas that I, I share, you know, it might not work specifically for your organisation, but how might you modify it slightly uh, for your organisation and your community and then it might uh, provide an opportunity. Okay, so we're going to focus on membership up front. So first up, membership. Uh, and some of you identified that you are, uh, some of you, a few of you are raising uh, income from membership uh, already. Let me share with you first the definition of membership. So uh, the definition of membership is to belong or to have a sense of belonging. And quite often uh, what happens is uh, you might be tapping into membership as an income stream, but often it looks like uh, you, uh, those so people who support you who will become your members pay a nominal membership fee in order to access your services. Uh, and I want to flip that on its head to talk about membership in the context of sustainable funding. So when I'm talking membership for sustainable funding, it's not in any way, shape or form related to those for whom you provide services right now. Where I feel the opportunity is with membership, is in looking into your community and looking for opportunities where you can fill a need in terms of wanting to belong or having that sense of belonging for a target group within your community. Uh, and so it's not about membership uh, for those that you support already. It's about looking at your community and creating a membership package uh, of benefits and things that add value for those that you want to sign up as members, uh, which encourages them to sign up. And they are people that you are not supporting right now. So it's an, it's an income stream. And the best way to give you an example of this is to provide an example. Uh, and it's not an arts example, but I use this example all the time because it is often quite counter to the way that we think about membership. So this uh, example of membership is from uh, a branch of the Women's Refuge. So it's a branch of the Women's Refu Refuge uh, that's operating in a very small community and they wanted to think about how membership might be a potential income stream for them. Unequivocally, what they are absolutely not talking about is charging those that they support uh, as a branch of Women's Refuge to access their support. That is not at all what they were uh, interested in focusing on. In fact, that's very, very uh, as far from what they wanted to do as you can possibly get. But they did feel that there was an opportunity for them in terms of raising funds through membership. And they talked about what would they put together. So they looked at their community, smaller community, and they realised there wasn't really anything around uh, that really helped connect uh, women aged between uh, 25 and 45. So that was the target, women in the community aged between 25 and 45. 
And uh, so they thought about what would we put together as a package that would encourage uh, people to join our membership uh, 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 offering and give them that sense of getting benefits from joining and getting that sense of belonging whilst helping us to raise funds. And they created the idea of uh, the uh, of a of a of a free, of, sorry for, of a membership offering called the Inspirational Women's Club. Okay, so how it worked was the first step they approached businesses in the community who had the same target market. So women aged 25 to 45, they said, "This is us. This is the difference that we make in our community, and we're looking to raise funds through uh, creating a, a French a, a, a membership scheme, which we've called uh, Inspirational Women." And uh, and we'd like when people sign up to become uh, an inspirational woman, we want them to be able to uh, come to your store and shop and receive a discount because they're part of our membership uh, our membership offering. Uh, and most of the stores that they approached uh, absolutely signed up because they didn't really have to do much. All they had to do was uh, provide a 10% discount when someone came into the store to shop. But actually, there was a lot of benefit for them because they were getting their target market into the store or through being part of Inspirational Woman. Uh, so that was the first part of uh, the program of benefits. The other things that they did, they included, uh, they had uh, uh, events. So they had six monthly events where uh, the, the people who were part of the Inspirational Woman group already uh, could buy a ticket uh, and they had to pay $10 for that ticket, but that helped cover the cost of, of creating the event. Uh, and then they could also invite a friend to come along. So it was a buy one, get one free kind of offer. So they could bring a friend who wasn't already uh, an Inspirational Woman to come along and be part of uh, the evening. Uh, and it was a very smart move because then that meant they had their inspirational woman coming along anyway, and they were bringing someone who wasn't yet uh, signed up as a as a member of the inspirational woman. Uh, but uh, hopefully by the end of the night they might have been. They also did other things. So you could uh, walk around town holding your drink bottle, which had inspirational woman wearing a t-shirt, which was uh, branded, uh, and driving a car with a bumper sticker that said inspirational woman. So it got lots of discussions happening in the community around who, well, what is this and how do we get involved? Uh, and they also created a newsletter. So not one of those newsletters that comes into your uh, inbox and you think, ah, I could read that, but I'll never get that couple of minutes of my life back. It was very much focused on what did their inspirational woman want to read about. So they had all sorts of different things included uh, as part of the newsletter. Uh, and they could tell from, uh, you know, the statistics behind sending it out uh, that lots of people uh, were, were connecting with that newsletter and opening it up and finding it really helpful. So those are the, some of the things that they included as part of uh, their membership offering, Inspirational Woman. Uh, and they found three things. One thing they found was that it turned people who had uh, Women's Refuge as a heart uh, organisation, it turned them from being uh, ad hoc donors into uh, uh, ongoing contributors because each year they paid their membership fee uh, to be part of Inspirational Woman. Uh, the second thing that they uh, noticed was that uh, there were people who, uh, you know, they, they had, you know, that they, they really uh, appreciated the difference that Women's Refuge made in the community, but hadn't taken the step from connecting and understanding and, and buying into the why to actually making uh, or supporting in a financial sense. So it also converted those people into regular uh, contributors because they as well were uh, signing up for their membership each year. And the third thing that they noticed was that there were a whole group of, uh, of women aged 25 to 45 in the community who signed up to be part of the Inspirational Woman uh, who, who hadn't uh, contributed to Women's Refuge in any way, shape or form and possibly wouldn't because it wasn't uh, an organisation that they had a heart connect with, but they loved the idea of Inspirational Woman and all of the things and the values and the benefits that were attached to that. So they then become, became regular uh, givers as well, or regular contrib contributors in a financial sense as well, in terms of paying their fee, uh, their membership fee each year. So um, there were three things that that branch of the Women's Refuge found that they didn't expect in terms of tapping into membership as an income stream. So there's a few things attached to uh, tapping into membership as an income stream. It takes a bit of work, then all things raising funds for your organisation takes some work to get them up and running. Uh, but it is definitely an income stream that once it's up and running, as long as you keep connected with your members, uh, it can be a, a consistent source of income. And once you've covered the cost to set it up, 
then uh, your sources of income are uh, past operating each year are uh, 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 income, untagged income for your organisation. Uh, it's also an awesome income stream and also an opportunity to do with other organisations in your community. So one of the things that can help you to tap into, especially as a small organisation in a small community, that can help you to tap into an income stream like membership is doing it with other organisations. So it's not related to what you do as an organisation, uh, but it is something that you can uh, deliver and earn income from alongside other organisations in your community. And it's a really nice way to spread the load in terms of, of getting things done. So that's as much as I wanted to share uh, about membership. But the key things that I'd love you to take away from it are, it's an opportunity to do something in your community where you create that sense of belonging or enable people to feel they like they belong. It's not related to the people that you provide services for already. Uh, you need to find a target group in your community uh, who is looking for that sense of creating, a sense of connecting or that sense of belonging. So the Women's Refuge example is women aged 25 to 45. It could be families in your community. It could be businesses in your community that are looking for the opportunity to connect. Uh, it could be older persons. Uh, there's a whole raft of different opportunities in terms of that target market. And once you're clear on your target market, you can think about what are the uh, elements of my membership offering that I would put together because they would provide benefits and value and be attractive for my target who I'm looking to get to sign up. And in terms of that ongoingness, it's one of the income streams that's the easiest to tap into ongoing or sustainable. Because each year you're checking in with your members to see what they love, what they don't love so much, what would they like to see, and you're providing that uh, so that they uh, tick over uh, and pay their membership fee each year uh, in an ongoing nature. Awesome. Okay, so that's what I wanted to cover in terms of membership. Uh, next income stream that I'd love to dive into is donations. So the definition of a donation is a gift given with no strings attached. Uh, donations can be big or small. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the difference between definition and sponsor, uh, donations and sponsorship in just a second. But quite often I get the question of, you know, we want to bypass all those small donations, which are a little bit annoying. We want to get straight to the big donations. That's where the opportunity is at. Uh, and so let me share with you uh, a very important point around donations. And that is, often people will make a donation, a smaller donation to start, to, to test out your organisation. So how do they treat me when I make a small donation? Uh, you know, how does the, op uh, the organisation operate? Uh, and once they build trust with your organisation based on that small donation and based on your uh, saying thank you for that small donation because uh, the thank you is your most potent tool to get from small one-off donation to next donation and no next donation after that. Uh, once uh, they test the waters, then that increases the chances of uh, then giving you a larger donation down the track. So it's very rare to meet someone for the first time, ask for a massive donation and receive it. You need to do some work uh, uh, building relationships uh, and making sure that you uh, thank uh, donors for whatever amount uh, that they give your organisation. Two things to keep in mind in terms of donation. So one is, two key points, one is to take and make as many opportunities as you can to make the ask. So we do a lot of uh, research with all sorts of different organisations and this is actually some research that we did with our small businesses. So uh, we asked those small businesses, what is it that makes you or that encourages you to give when a community organisation approaches you and, and uh, asks for a donation? And the number one thing uh, that uh, encourages them to give is being asked, yeah? So without a doubt, uh, if you don't ask, you won't get. If you do ask, the worst thing that can happen is you get a no. So take and make as many opportunities as you can to make the ask. And there's hundreds of different ways that you can do that. So often uh, when I ask the question, you know, what are all the ways that you can give uh, people the opportunity to give because that's what you're doing. You're giving people the opportunity to give to your organisation to help you do what you do. Uh, uh, so, um, so take and make as many opportunities as you possibly can. And I'm going to talk about a couple in just a second. Uh, but 
often face-to-face -face is thought of as, as the main way, but there's lots of different ways that you can tap into donations. So something simple like a donations box uh, in different organisations in your community. So do you have an art supply store in your community where you might uh, visit them and say, this is us, this is the difference that we make, and we uh, would love the opportunity to put a donations box uh, on your counter. It's lots of small uh, donations, but often the small donations are what add up to to make a larger donation. And it, at the very least is raising your profile in your community so that people start to know that you exist uh, and then potentially, uh, you know, look out for you and try and find out more about your organisation. So our first point is to take and make as many opportunities to make the ask as you can. The second really important tip around donations is respectfully telling your story. Uh, so uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the story of, of Joe Millionaire. So this is a handed down through the generations kind of story. Uh, it's a story of Joe Millionaire. I'm not sure that that was the name that he was given when he was born, uh, but it's the name that he's assumed for this uh, story. He decided that he'd like to be a millionaire. And he knew that given where he was based, so he was based in a very, very small community, a small, small rural community, uh, that, and given the skills that he had at that point in time in his life, uh, if he stayed where he was doing what he was doing, it was unlikely that he would become a millionaire. So what he decided to do was pack up everything and he decided that he would travel New Zealand uh, and he would uh, share his story and he would ask one million people for one dollar and that is how he would achieve his goal of becoming a millionaire. And I reckon this is one of the very first examples of crowdfunding before the internet made it much easier than packing up everything you own and, and doing a, a nationwide trip. Uh, so he would approach people and he would say, hi, my name's Joe Millionaire. I'm not collecting for... Uh, charity or a good cause, I'm collecting for myself. I've set the goal of uh, becoming a millionaire uh, and in order to help me achieve that goal, I'm traveling uh, the country and I'm asking one million people to donate one dollar. Do you have a dollar that you can donate? So respectfully telling your story. Uh, and what you're doing when you're respectfully telling your story is you're sharing your why and your what uh, and you're making the ask. And we know about the story of Joe Millionaire because he approached a, a fabulous colleague of mine at Mount Beach and he shared that story. Hi, my name's Joe Millionaire. I'm not collecting for charity or a good cause. Uh, I'm collecting for myself. Uh, I've set myself the goal of becoming a millionaire. Uh, and in order to help me to achieve that goal, I'm traveling the country and I'm asking one million people to donate one dollar. Do you have a dollar that you can donate? And given what we do, uh, my colleague was intrigued by what he was doing. So she asked lots and lots of questions. She actually had $5 in her pocket, which she said is not something she often does. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, these days, Joe Millennium might have traveled with tap and go as a way of taking, uh, uh, making it easy for people to make donations. Uh, but she gave him that $5 and she asked him lots of questions. So where have you been? Have you found that different regions have been uh, more giving? Have you changed the way you shared your story? Has that changed the uh, reaction that you've got from people? And the all-important question to end with, which was how much have you raised so far? So uh, there's no way to, to corroborate uh, Joe Millionaire's uh, estimation at that point in time as to how much he'd raised, but he said he'd raised around about $35,000. So it's lots of littles uh, building to make a larger donation. But the most important thing I'd love you to take away from that story is respectfully telling your story. Uh, and there's two tools that you can use to help you respectfully tell your story. And they're two tools that are not often used, but I think they're the most, one of the most powerful or two of the most powerful in your arsenal. And they are your vision and your mission. I would love it if you would check in with your vision and mission. I've got some really clear ideas around what is a vision and what is a mission and how they can fit together to, to, respect, to help you respectfully tell your story. So I want you to check your vision. Does your vision articulate why you exist? And does your mission articulate what you do? So your vision's all about your why. Why do you exist? What's your purpose? What is the difference that you want to make for those in your community that you support? Not for your whole community or the whole world at large, for those that you support. Your mission is what you do. Specifically, what do you do to walk to work towards that vision? Uh, I'm going to give you a, a couple of really quick uh, examples. So uh, at the start of the session, I shared, uh, uh, I introduced myself. And I used to introduce myself by saying, hi, I'm Megan from Exalt. We provide training and support for community and not-for-profit organisations at the business end of, of what you do. And it's kind of like, meh, so what? 
There's no connection there. It's just, it's a what, it's what we do. Now I'm much better at sharing, uh, I'm Megan from Exalt, and we are really passionate about working towards all community and not-for-profit organisations working at their full potential. And the way that we do that is through providing training and support for community and not-for-profit organisations at the business end of running your organisation. So that's our vision and our mission put together uh, that I share every time I meet someone for the first time or at the start of every workshop, uh, in fact. So uh, a great way of respectfully sharing your story or telling your story is to share your vision up front, which articulates why you exist and the difference that you make for those you support, and then sharing what behind it, which is literally what you do in order to do that. So I'm going to share a question with you. So uh, the first thing I'd love you to do is check in with your vision and mission. Does your vision articulate why you exist as, a, as an organisation and the difference that you're looking to make for the community you support? Does your mission articulate what you do? And when you put them together, is that now a really nice way that you can respectfully tell your story? And I'm talking about it in the context of asking for donations, but actually I talk about this in the context of everything that you do in terms of raising your profile, in terms of governance, in terms of every different income stream, uh, in terms of connecting with volunteers, all of those things. Uh, if you can sh share your strong vision that articulates why you exist uh, and your mission that articulates what you do, it increases your chances of, of an emotional connection. So in the context of donations, that's what you're looking for, respectfully telling your story in order to, uh, to get that emotional connection. Uh, and in the notes, I'll share a link to a talk by a guy called Simon Sinek. And he has a TED talk, uh, which is called Start With Why. And what often happens is someone will say to us, what do you do uh, in terms of your organisation? And we'll answer that with our mission, literally what we do. And then it misses an opportunity to get that emotional connection. So the language that you use when you describe why you exist is what connects with the emotion and decision-making part of your brain. When you share what you do, the language that you use connects with the part of your brain that's responsible for information and data processing. So we need to get really great at starting with why, because people don't buy what you do, they buy why you exist. And when I say buy, I mean connect. People don't connect at an emotional level with what you do, it'll increase the chances of connecting at an emotional level when you get really great at talking about why you do that. Uh, so here's a question that you can use to help you craft why you exist, if that's not how your mission is, uh, your vision is crafted right now. So I'm going to talk to it quickly and it'll come to you in the notes. So if you don't get the chance to write it down, uh, you'll have it in front of you in the, in the notes. So the question is, if your organisation was doing everything 100% right, what would your community look like as a result? If your organisation was doing everything 100% right, what would your community look like as a result? Uh, and I wanted to give you two very, very quick, uh, uh, quick examples. So one is of a community centre. Uh, and this is a story from a while back where this community centre was receiving ACE funding. So funding coming out uh, the, uh, the wing wing, I'm not sure is a technical term. They had lots of funding. They had enough funding to do what they needed to do, so much so that funding was not an issue for them. Uh, almost overnight, there was a change with how ACE funding worked. And they no longer had the funding that they did have. And they'd actually got to the point where they were almost on the brink of closing their doors because they hadn't created the stable table. So when they lost the ACE funding, they lost funding for their organisation and had nothing to uh, support the costs. Uh, so uh, a colleague of mine was a very good friend of the lady who ran the community centre. And um, she, she rang up and she's like, I've, I have exhausted all possibilities in terms of funding for our community centre. Uh, you know, I've gone to the community, I've asked for donations, I've done lots of stuff, and and I don't, I just don't understand. We, we can't, you know, we, we're struggling to raise the funds that we had to to keep the doors open. And so my lovely colleague, who very respectfully asked this question and could do so because they were good friends, she said, you know, there's another community centre, you know, in a town that's also very close to you. Would it be so bad if you had to close your doors? Because wouldn't people just go to their other community centre and then they'd still have programs and activities? Uh, and a very good friend stopped for a second, a little bit flummoxed. That's not the response I was expecting. She's like, no, you don't understand. If we closed our doors, then, uh, you know, there were, we do all these programs and people wouldn't be able to come to the program. We do this program doing this and this activity and this for this group. And, 
you know, if we closed our doors, people wouldn't have access to all of those programs, which are really important. And my colleagues said, yes, I understand that's what you do. So all the programs and activities, that's what you do. But actually, people could do that other places, couldn't they? So, you know, what would be the impact of you closing your doors? And her friend waited for a second again. She's like, oh, she's starting to get a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit um, frustrated. She's like, no, you don't understand. If we closed our doors, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this program or this program or this program or, you know, there's this activity and that group of people wouldn't be able to come into the centre. And just said, you understand what you do, my colleague this is, uh, but, you know, if you had to close the doors, what, what would be the bad thing about that? And she's got to the point after a couple of back and forth where she is quite frustrated by this point, as you can imagine. She said, you don't understand, you know, if we shut our doors, there would be a lot of lonely people in our community. And that was the why. So she'd been talking to her what, uh, but she hadn't been able to articulate their why, and their why wasn't articulated as part of uh, their vision. So their vision was to create a community where no one had to be, feel lonely. Uh, and once she got to that point and she was really clear around why they existed, she could then go out to a community uh, and connect with people and really share the difference that they were making in the community. Uh, and another example I wanted to share very, very quickly uh, is that of a, a budgeting organisation. Uh, so this budgeting organisation, we sent them this question, the, if your organisation was doing everything 100% right, what would your community look like as a result? Uh, we sent uh, them that question before helping them work on their vision. Uh, and the manager of the budgeting organisation uh, rang up a week before the uh, workshop, very, very excited. And she was like, we loved that question. Gosh, it helped us to think about our why. And uh, we've, we've, we've created a draft and we wanted to share it with you before the session to make sure we we're on the right track. And at that point, the draft of their vision, why they existed, and I've got to read it here because it's quite long, was to create a community where people were empowered to make sound financial decisions and could live a life of abundance and prosperity. So it's quite long, that we definition or that we crafting of their, uh, of their vision. And it's got lots of big jargony words. So empowered, uh, abundance, prosperity, quite often with a vision, the power of the vision is in its simplicity. So using really simple language and no jargon. And we said, awesome start. And at the end of the session, uh, which happened a week later, their vision uh, is to create a community where nobody has to wake up and worry about money. Yep. So miles away from abundance, prosperity, empowered, blah, 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 to create a community where no one has to wake up and worry about money. It enables you to create a, almost a visual in your mind, paint a picture of the difference that they're trying to make, that organisation is trying to make in their community. So uh, it's really important uh, in the context of uh, taking and making as many opportunities to make the ask as po possible having a well-crafted and strong vision that is very using very simple language with no jargon uh, and a mission that frames up what you do makes it way easier for everybody in your organisation to share your vision and mission and to take and make the opportunity to make the ask in the context of, of, uh, of donations while respectfully sharing your story. Uh, so I'd love you to, uh, next steps in terms of, of uh, vision and mission, check in with your vision, does it articulate why you exist? Check in with your mission, does it articulate what you do? And how do you use them together to, to do that very first introduction or elevate a pitch if you like? And always, always start with why. So lead with why, even when someone asks you, what do you do? Flip the question on its head uh, and start with your why. Are we really passionate about uh, all community and not-for-profit organizations? organizations working at the full potential and the way that we do that is through providing training and support da, 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 da. so uh, flip it around and start with why lovely and I wanted to talk about one example uh, for donations as well uh, which relates to that opportunity to take and make as many opportunities uh, as many take and make as many opportunities as you can to make the ask uh, and that is through uh, digital platforms. So I'm sure that some of you will know about Boosted, uh, boosted.org.nz, uh, the arts uh, fundraising platform, uh, crowdfunding platform, but also Give a Little. So those are two examples of platforms that enable you to make the ask in a wider, uh, as wide a sense as you possibly can. 
So uh, with technology platforms like that, you're now not constrained to just making the ask within the community, but every one of your supporters and stakeholders can potentially push that ask out as far and wide as you possibly can via technology. So it increases your chances of, of being able to uh, make the ask and raise lots of small amounts towards uh, a larger amount. And a great example of that right now on Boosted Platform is uh, with the Boo Boost Paper Mill and Charitable Trust or the Paper Mill. So they've got a, a, a crowdfunding initiative running on Boosted right now where they're looking to raise $7,500 to, uh, to, to purchase and create bespoke moulds and decals to help them uh, make uh, their paper. So uh, I won't even stand here and pretend I know what, what decals are. I'm pretty clear on what moulds are. But what I love about uh, this initiative is they've been really clear about how much do they need. Uh, and possibly they might need a little bit more than the 7,500 that they're looking through to raise through Boosted. Uh, but Boosted is an awesome opportunity maybe to help them raise a good chunk of what they're looking to raise. So they're really specific around $7,500 uh, is what they're looking to raise. But through Boosted and their online platform, they can, uh, they can share uh, their vision and mission and talk about what they're trying to do. They can share their story. They can share videos of their programs in action and really connect people with those that they support uh, uh, and show the difference that they make, obviously, in a way where everyone has given their permission. Uh, and they can then send a link to raise through that platform out as far and wide as they possibly can. And it takes giving online. And online giving is one of the forms of giving that is growing. So if you don't have the opportunity to take donations online, that is love, something that I'd love you to explore on leaving uh, this workshop. So give a little is a way that you can do that. Uh, they do take an administration fee, as does Boosted. But I always think that, you know, 10% uh, in the case of Boosted of, uh, sorry, 90% of funds raised, because you could do that uh, through a, an online platform, is uh, far more helpful than 0% of funds raised, because you can't do that through an online platform. So um, Boosted is one example. There's another example that I wanted to share too, which is raisley.com, R-A-I-S-L-E-Y. Uh, it's also an online platform that enables you to run fundraising initiatives online and you can use the Raisley platform for free. Uh, and it has a lot of the functionality where you can set up your own web page through Raisley. Uh, you can take donations online. Uh, you can do a whole lot of different things uh, at an online level uh, to help you tap into donations as an income stream. In terms of moving from donations as a one-off to ongoing, uh, the, the, the best tool that you have in your arsenal is the firstly to say thank you. Uh, so there's all sorts of statistics around the importance of thanking people when they make a donation for the, the first time. So when you say thank you to someone when they make their first donation, no matter how big or small it is, it increases their chances of giving a second time uh, by 48%. Uh, when you say thank you after that second donation in a nice timely manner, so timely manner, timely is important within 24 hours, uh, it increases your chances of getting a third donation by something like 68%. So saying thank you is vitally important. Uh, and there's also interesting statistics around people who don't give for a second time. So only 19% of donors give for a second time because as community organisations, we're not usually so great at saying thank you. So we put all the work into getting the first donation and then we lose the opportunity to make it ongoing because we don't follow up with a thank you. So the importance of the thank you, I almost can't stress it enough. Lovely. Okay, so that is donations. All right, uh, the third income stream that I wanted to focus on is sponsorship. Uh, the definition of sponsorship is to assume responsibility for. Uh, and often donations and sponsorships, a donation and sponsorship is used interchangeably by both the organisations that we're talking to or the people that we're talking to and by us as organisations looking to raise funds. So donations are very, very different Here's my donation. Sponsorship is about assuming a level of responsibility for. So uh, let me give you a couple of, one example. So uh, one example is, you know, when someone goes through uh, an AA program, they are paired with a sponsor. 
So that sponsor assumes a certain level of responsibility for the success of that person in their junior year to sobriety. Uh, and at the same time, though, that person assumes a level of responsibility for the success in their journey. So they both assume responsibility for the success of the other. Uh, it's a partnership, which is the same for sponsorship. So sponsorship is a partnership between yourself uh, and 99.999% of the time a business in which you are assuming a certain level of responsibility for the success of that business. And at the same time, that business is assuming a certain level of success for the uh, responsibility for the success of your uh, initiative, your program, uh, your uh, activity, uh, or your organization, depending on what you're talking about in the context of sponsorship. So the difference between donations and sponsorship is based around intent. Donation, the intent is a gift given with no strings attached. Uh, I love what you do. I'd like you help, to help you uh, make it happen. With sponsorship, the business always has an intention to get something out of that partnership. Uh, and so sponsorship is not a philanthropic decision. Sponsorship is a decision but made by an, a business to spend a portion of their marketing budget on sponsorship. Uh, and in just the same way as they would expect a return on spending that marketing budget in different ways. Uh, so, you know, putting an ad on the TV, let's say, on the radio, let's say, you know, plastering the back of a bus, driving around your community uh, with uh, their ad. Uh, in the same way uh, that they're looking for a return on that spend, that marketing spend, they're also looking for a return on spend and sponsorship. Uh, and I think that that is an opportunity for community and not-for-profit organisations. So what sometimes happens with sponsorship is we look around our community and we think, oh, that's a big business that's making, you know, must be making quite a good profit. Um, I bet they've got a bit of money to, to put towards sponsorship. Uh, and it's not always the best way to approach to increase your chances of success. Uh, the best way or the one step uh, in terms of increasing your chances of success with sponsorship is to be really clear around who you can put potential sponsors in touch with. Because what a sponsor is looking for when they enter into a sponsorship partnership uh, is they're not, they're usually looking for exposure or they're usually looking for a way to increase their bottom line. And one way that they can do that is through getting exposure to the people who are most likely to buy their products or services. So they're not looking for exposure to uh, the world at large, they're looking for exposure to the people who are most likely to buy their products or services. Uh, and so the first step for you as an organisation thinking about sponsorship is to be really clear around who you can put potential sponsors in touch with. Uh, and let me once again give you an example to bring it to life a little bit more. So we did some work with an organisation that supports families uh, with children with autism and they were looking at sponsorship as a way of raising funds for their organisation and uh, so we said well who can you put potential sponsors in touch with so who 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 and uh, they were like well that's really easy actually you know we could connect uh, you know people with well, we could connect with anyone really that is you know, has experienced, um, either has a child with autism that they're supporting or as part of a wider family or as a school friend or, you know, anyone really who has had experience of uh, uh, supporting someone in a family with autism, you know, we could connect a sponsor with. And we like that might be the case, but that's a very wide uh, group of people. So we went through a process and there's two steps through the process. The first is to ask that question, who, 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 who can you put potential sponsors in touch with? Uh, and in doing that process, uh, sit with that question and post it notes and marker pens and create a list, all of the who's that you can possibly think of. So there will be those that you support. Uh, there will also be people who are helping you to provide your programs or services. You may have volunteers who are part of that. There'll be your trustees. Uh, there'll be people that you deal with or organisations that you deal with on a day to day basis in your community. Think about the whole list of who's, who is in your sphere of influence. And then take each of those who's one at a time and look for commonalities and similarities between them. Where are the connections? Because you're looking to be able to frame up a target market. So this organization, uh, uh, target market for then whom you can look at businesses who want to be connected with them as well. 
So uh, in doing this process, that organisation that supported uh, families with children with autism, they were really clear about who, were, who they connected with as part of their organisation. Uh, so uh, they knew that for their organisation specifically, they mostly supported boys, and it just happened to be who that they who they supported as an organisation. They knew a lot about uh, the the kids that they supported. So most of those boys were aged uh, were aged uh, sorry eight to fourteen, uh, and they also knew that a lot of the boys that they supported, age eight to fourteen, loved dinosaurs. So now they have a target group. So uh, we can they could go out to the community and say we can connect you with. Uh, this number of boys aged 8 to 14 who love dinosaurs. Now, when I say that, unequivocally, I do not mean you could provide contact details. So the value that you bring to a sponsorship partnership is where you become the conduit between the business who is looking to enter a sponsorship partnership and the target market that you can connect them with. So you completely control how they connect, uh, but you are the conduit who is in the middle. Uh, and uh, so once they thought about that specific target market, boys age age 14 who love dinosaurs, they thought about the businesses in their community. Uh, and there was an educational toy store that had opened up just recently. Uh, and they approached the educational toy store and said, this is us. This is the difference we make in the community. Uh, and we are looking to uh, connect you. Uh, sorry, we are looking to connect with businesses uh, in terms of sponsorship opportunities. Uh, and the manager of the educational toy store absolutely saw the connect. So it changes the nature of your approach from your cap in hand, can you please business give us some money, to actually business your approach. Uh, and from a, a, an opportunity point of view for a business, it's a connection with a quality number of their target market versus the scattergun approach, which is an ad on the radio or on TV or in the paper, which will indeed connect with thousands more people potentially, but only a fraction of that number of people will be actually their target market. So that's the opportunity with sponsorship. Uh, and in terms of turning that into something ongoing, it's all about relationships, relationships, relationships. So once you uh, start a relationship with a sponsor, then the way that you manage that relationship, uh, make sure that you keep connecting uh, and make sure you share the difference that is made through their sponsorship. Uh, and also talk about how your partnership can evolve as time goes on. That increases your chances of going from one-off uh, sponsorship to, uh, to ongoing an ongoing relationship. Lovely. All right, last two income streams I'm going to cover very, very quickly. Uh, first one is fundraising activities. And often when I start talking about fundraising activities, I get a bit of roll of the eyes. Uh, and that's often because when we think about fundraising activities, sometimes we're thinking about the old classics like a sausage sizzle. Uh, whereas I think the opportunity with fundraising activities comes from the ability and opportunity to do anything that you want. So top tip in terms of fundraising activities is to look at your community and look for part, sections or groups in your community that are completely under catered for in terms of the opportunity to do some fun stuff. So in the same way as we talked about membership, uh, if you looked at your community and thought, you know, there's a gap uh, for women aged 25 to 45, let's use the same target market, to get together and have a bit of fun, then that's a potential uh, focus, a target for a fundraising activity. And then the next opportunity is around how you can do things that are really different. So it's not the sausage sizzle. Uh, it's a day at the races uh, using moon hoppers as the horses. Uh, so they're, th they're fundraising activities, they're activities that don't often happen in your community, and they're the things that will get people interested and to take notice of, uh, of, of, of the activity that you're creating and increase the chances of them coming along. So the first step is to uh, think about who is the target in your community and then create a really exciting, different fundraising activity that will appeal to that target market. Uh, fundraising activities also take a bit of work to make them happen, and often uh, there is um, the opportunity from fundraising activities comes from your ability to scale things up. So it's not you know 50 sausages sold at the sausage sizzle; it's 500 tickets sold for a fantastic community event aimed at a specific target market. 
and often that is something that you can do through collaborating with other organizations. Uh, so look at, at for opportunities where you can scale up uh, and potentially collaborate with other organizations in your community and they don't have to be creative spaces uh, to help you uh, do that scaling up. Uh, and last, income stream before we get to questions, so Amy has let me know that there's lots of questions coming through and we may not have the opportunity to uh, talk to all of them. Uh, but like I said, put them in uh, the uh, Q&A tab and we'll create a Q&A uh, section uh, to go with the notes that come from the session. Uh, but the one I, last income stream I wanted to tap on or tap into, uh, touch on is uh, a social enterprise or earned income. So that's where you're trading using a business model to earn income for your organization to help you do what you do. Uh, and most of you, in fact, when we did the poll, there were a few of you who are uh, earning nicely in terms of uh, earned income or social enterprise for your organizations. And some of you will hire your venues. Some of you will hold exhibitions or sell art as a way of potentially raising funds for your organization. There's all sorts of different ways that you can earn income, sometimes related to your vision and your mission, sometimes not related to your vision and your mission. Uh, so um, one example that I wanted to give really quickly uh, is of a, a, a brand of wine called 27 Seconds. So uh, 27 Seconds uh, is a company uh, that has been set up uh, by two people who were very aware of the impact of the slave trade uh, uh, globally. So every 27 seconds, a child or a, uh, an adult is, is, is uh, kidnapped and taken into slavery. So uh, 27 Seconds uh, is a winemaker who has created this label and brand called 27 Seconds uh, and they sell their wine and all of the profit made from selling their wine is uh, shared with an organisation called Hagar International who focuses on uh, decreasing the slave trade and helping people get out of uh, slavery uh, in countries like Vietnam and Laos. Uh, and through the sales of their wine, they've contributed $145,000 so far to Hagar International to help them do what they do. But it's an example of earned income. Uh, so it's an example that I shared too, because one of the opportunities in terms of earned income is what skills or knowledge do you have in a specific area? And how can you tap into that skills or knowledge uh, to potentially raise funds for your organization? The second opportunity in terms of social enterprise is what specialist equipment or resources do you own uh, that potentially are not being used all the time and that you can potentially uh, hire out uh, at a market rate and earn income for your organisation through providing those, uh, uh, those, uh, that equipment or those resources. So those are two potential options for earned income. And I'll pop heaps of examples. There's so many examples of organisations who are uh, have really strong income streams through uh, earned income. I'll pop heaps of examples uh, in the notes. Awesome. So we've got five more minutes before you uh, snap back to uh, the main session. Uh, uh, I'd love to uh, check in uh, in terms of questions. So Amy's going to help me out here in terms of questions. Lovely. Okay. So question number one, when asking for sponsorship, what can we offer businesses to get them to get something in return? Okay. So, uh, the best way to think about this is to think about what you have to offer. So think about all of the different uh, 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 resources and assets that you have at your disposal that you can package up uh, that will appeal to businesses in terms of their opportunity to connect with their target market. So uh, one of the things that you might do, for example, uh, have, for example, is the opportunity to uh, enable sponsors to speak directly to your target market as part of a, a, a package that you put together. Uh, so where you can do that, then you offer, that's a, it's a really strong uh, opportunity because it gives the, the sponsor the ability to connect directly with the target market, but you are still the conduit. Uh, and talk about what they have and how that can be of benefit to those who are their target market, who is in effect their captured or captive audience. So top tip in terms of what have you got to offer is to think about all of the assets that uh, you have as part of your organization. So uh, you've got your Facebook page, you've got your website, you've got any uh, events that you hold. I'll pop a list uh, in uh, the notes. 
Uh, and then think about how would you package those up uh, in order to offer something that is of ben benefit and value for your sponsor. But what people, our sponsors are looking for is the opportunity to connect. So it's past putting a logo on something, it's that opportunity to connect directly with the target market. Uh, so second question, fantastic information. Are you running any workshops in the Wellington region? So we'll let you know, I'll put a link to our website, uh, which uh, the schedule for workshops uh, for 2023 will be coming up very soon. And we often run workshops online as well. So keep a, a check in with our website. Uh, you can also sign up for a newsletter where uh, we'll let you know when workshops are running as well. I'm very interested in what kind of contracts organisations are getting and with whom. Okay, okay, okay. So let me think about how we uh, put that into the forum to get uh, back from people. So one way uh, that you can know what contracts exist is through uh, the, uh, the contracts database, gets, G-E-T-S dot G-O-V-T dot N-Z. Uh, so that is the place where government departments list all of the contracts uh, that are up for tender. So that's one way you can find contracts where uh, that, that, that uh, where government departments are looking for someone to provide services with the skills that you have. Uh, so that is, that's one way. Uh, and last question in the last two minutes, aren't sustainable funding options reliant on, whoa, crikey dickens, this is a question bigger than the two minutes that we have remaining. Uh, uh, my, my initial response to that question is no, uh, because if you're thinking about the community in which you operate, actually there's two things. One is what community are you operating within uh, and where are the opportunities within that community? Uh, and the second piece, uh, sustainable funding options are very much reliant on you as an organisation and what capacity and what skills that you have as an organisation. So there could be things that happen at a political level that maybe change uh, where funds, funds available to distribute. But I think you can also turn that on its head, like with sponsorship, for example, where now you have an opportunity where you can connect a sponsor directly with their target market. So that's an opportunity that they don't have through other avenues of marketing spend. So, um, and that's not necessarily related to what political party is in power. Right, that was a biggie to finish on. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to chat with you today. Thank you to Arts Access Aotearoa for creating this fantastic conference. Pile your questions into the Q&A tab uh, and we'll do our best to, uh, to, to share some thoughts around each. Thank you.